our next uh, talk and talker. Dr. McNamara is professor in uh, bio biomedical engineering at the National University of Ireland in Galway. She holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from Trinity College in Dublin <clears throat> and a first class honoris degree in mechanical engineering. She completed postdoctoral training at Mount Sinai uh, School of Medicine in New York. And from 2007 to 2009, she was a lecturer in mechanobiology and musculoskeletal biomechanics at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. So she traveled quite a bit. Uh, she was appointed in 2009 uh, as a science foundation stoker lecturer in biomedical engineering, again at the National University of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And there she established uh, the mechanobiology and medical device research team. Her research group have published widely and have attracted significant prizes and funding, most notably the European Research Council Consolidated Award in 2019 and the Starting Independent Research Award again from the European Research Council in 2011, uh, the Science Foundation Ireland Investigator Grant in 2016 and various others. So she was awarded the Irish Research Council's Research of the Year Award in 2019 she has uh, interdisciplinary research collaboration with researchers uh, at the Georgia Tech, Notre Dame University, City College of New York, uh, and many others. She collaborated also with uh, industries, uh, with Stryker, Boston Scientific, and Medtronic. Professor McNamara Research Group used uh, multidisciplinary approaches to derive understanding of bone mechanical biology and how this process contributed to develop uh, <clears throat> physiology and bone disease. The mechanobiology and medical device research group uses experimental and computational techniques to identify the specific mechanical sensation and mechanical transduction mechanism by which bone cells sense mechanical stimuli. So we are all, I think, very excited to see how these uh, two parts of the simulation and the experimental uh, experience can merge uh, in your research. Please, uh, Professor. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. Um, so uh, now that's showing my two slides. How do I change that now? Um, I'm gonna have to escape that for a second. I'm just showing the preview, which I don't want it to do. Um, I don't know if you're using two screens, uh, Lois. Yeah, no problem, yeah. So if you're using two screens, my advice is, is to boot the board. Okay, yeah. that's perfect, fantastic. <laughs> I forget that sometimes when I've, I've actually three screens here, but anyway, that's how, how we virtually work now. M many screens makes it possible. Um, so thanks for the introduction now. Uh, so I, I just wanted to uh, start by um, just kind of giving a flavor of, of you know, why mechanobiology, I suppose, um, is interesting to me and the types of questions that my group seek to understand and hopefully motivate people to think about the importance of multidisciplinary and multi-scale research in answering important questions uh, in mechanobiology. So I'm sure everybody here knows what mechanobiology is, but just to take a little focus on it again and its importance, it's fundamentally important from the very outset of life. So uh, cells in the human body are able to sense and respond to their mechanical environment. And this starts really early. So within a couple of days within the embryo, the small uh, cluster of cells are already contracting and pulling on each other. And if they can't do that, if their contractile behavior doesn't activate, then the embryo doesn't develop as it should. But even after that, we all again know this, uh, that babies' kicks are important in the embryo. And uh, in fact, if, if babies don't apply forces on, on their limbs during development within the embryo, they don't go on to develop a normal uh, skeleton and even the, mus the muscles and, and all the supporting tissues and ligaments. So uh, forces and mechanical forces are critical to biology from the various earliest stages of life. And um, I would argue that they're as crucial as genes and biochemicals, in particular for bone development, but for all tissues, but they're much uh, less well studied and understood. 
uh, we know, and these common examples of, of how they are important throughout life uh, are, are the extreme examples, such as, um, you know, elite athletes. So everybody would know that uh, the, the muscles increase in, in, in diameter and then the tissue structure changes over as we increase uh, physical activity and exercise. But of course, the bones themselves as well respond to the increased physical activity and exercise. And we end up in a situation where, uh, for example, here you can see some um, medical imaging of the bones of uh, elite tennis players, where you can see on the, uh, the image labeled with the right there, that uh, the bone, it's not just the muscles that are getting bigger, but the the density of the tissue is increasing in the bone as well. So, um, but then in, in long-term space flight as well. So if, if astronauts are at the International Space Station for six months and they don't take measures to mitigate uh, the, the weightlessness environment, they end up with bones as brittle as women in their 60s with osteoporosis. So this all together shows us that mechanical forces are critical to bone biology and, and uh, without those forces, things uh, go awry. So how does this happen? Well, first of all, uh, deep within our tissues, we have um, bone cells known as osteocytes. They can be considered to be the mechanosensory cells within the bone tissue. And they're a network of cells that are interconnected. Um, and what they can do is they can sense the mechanical environment by some means. And we'll talk a bit about that later on. And then they can signal, so they can send signals uh, both biochemically and, and within their dendrites to the actor cells at the surface with your osteoblasts and osteoclasts to either resorb bone or form bone depending on the physical environment that they uh, are uh, appreciating. So uh, unloading will encourage osteocytes to send signals to osteoclasts to resorb bone, whereas increased physical activity will uh, uh, activate osteoblasts to form new bone and, and, and build up the tissue to address that increased physical activity. So this is not just uh, something that's important to bone cells. Uh, there's many cells in the body that produce uh, and main tissues of the human body, and they are responsive to their mechanical environment. So I show here in this image um, an osteocyte cell. So uh, and in one example of one of the mechanisms by which osteocytes can sense and respond to their mechanical environment through transmembrane channels, which can be activated and opened uh, to allow um, influx and, and uh, uh, efflux of, of various uh, important signaling molecules. Um, but also the hair cells, so and uh, various different mechanosensitive cells throughout the body line epithelial airways and allow us to uh, fulfill various functions. For, for example, hearing is facilitated by the inner ear hair cells. And throughout our body, we have mechanosensitive cells that are continually monitoring various mechanical influences and forces and, and shear stresses. And then uh, on, on the basis of what they measure, they then send signals to other cells to, to do something uh, to, to uh, enable various tissue changes and, and functional uh, behaviors of tissues. So these processes in the human body are reliant fundamentally on mechanobiology. And the, the transduction, so how you get from the force itself to a biological change uh, involves uh, mechanotransduction, which is uh, where you have uh, the sensor cells measuring that force or the shear stress or, or stretch that they experience then they elicit biochemical signals, and then uh, other cells or the cells themselves are experiencing these biochemical signals. And then as a result, they either change things like gene expression or uh, various biological processes uh, in response to that. So this is inherently multidisciplinary. So it integrates cell and molecular biology, but also genetics and mechanics. And for today, I'm gonna to focus largely on our studies of the mechanics of the cells and the mechanical environment, and how we can also influence the mechanical environment to drive specific responses and understand disease. So the diseases that we're interested in, in my research group in particular are osteoporosis and bone metastasis. 
And um, there is evidence that, first of all, that uh, the bone tissue is not um, effectively designed in osteoporosis. So uh, when people go through the menopause or women go through the menopause, their estrogen levels drop. This leads to bone loss. And then ultimately the individuals uh, develop things like this dowager's hump here, which is uh, uh, characteristic um, of women with osteoporosis, but also their bones become very brittle and they fracture. And um, then in metastasis, you have a situation where primary tumors, uh, often from the, the breast or from the prostate, um, leave the primary site and invade bone tissue. And they form these lesions within the bone tissue, which are cancerous. This is known as a, a metastatic lesion. And uh, bone is a preferred site for metastasis for both breast and prostate cancer. So both of these questions are interesting to us. What, what is it? about the mechanobiology of bone that first of all um, is gone awry in osteoporosis that leads to bone loss and ultimately fracture, but also what it is about the mechanobiology of bone that drives metastasis. And I'll come back to both of those concepts uh, later on. So I just wanted to introduce them now. So the first thing I want to talk a bit about is why we got here. Why are we interested in the mechanobiology of bone and in osteoporosis. So for a long time, people considered osteoporosis to be a disease of bone loss. So simply that if you um, had estrogen levels dropping, that you were activating particular bone cells, the osteoclasts, to resorb bone. And then uh, the, the standard clinical approach to um, diagnosing osteoporosis is through looking at the bone mass, uh, through things like DEXA scanning, which is um, clinical resolutions, not very high resolution. So it gives us some information about bone loss, but very little understanding of the bone quality. So uh, diagnosis was done largely on bone mass and uh, drugs were prescribed to try and prevent any further bone loss. But these only prevented fracture in about 50% of patients. But of course, if we look at why a bone might break, there's many other factors involved. It's not just about the amount of bone that's there, but it's also about the quality of that tissue. So the morphology, whether or not there's a, a well-established microarchitecture that is designed well for the, the forces that it experiences. Also what the tissue is made of, what's the composition? Is there micro damage within it? So these questions uh, were of interest to me for quite a long time since my own PhD studies, whether or not the tissue in osteoporotic bone was fundamentally the same or had it somehow changed, was the quality altered? I'm not gonna spend time talking about it today because it's not the main focus of my talk, but I wanted to explain to you the motivation of why we're looking at mechanobiology and bone. And, and this is one study, recent enough study, which kind of illustrates what we've been finding over a number of years. And that is that in osteoporosis, this is micro CT scanning of uh, sham and overectomized or osteoporotic rats uh, over a period of up to 34 weeks. So we do in vivo, uh, high resolution micro CT scanning to see how the bone loss is occurring in the disease, but not only that, whether the tissue composition is changing. So up here on top, you can see that in the OVX animals, these are the osteoporotics, we do get a period of, first of all, rapid resorption. And we can see this in the graph down here uh, where bone is being lost rapidly. And uh, this happens a huge drop in the first four weeks and then a kind of drop levels off a bit, but continues to be lost. Um, and so a period of rapid resorption and then slow resorption. However, that's not the only thing that appears to be happening. So after this initial period of rapid resorption, what we see is we find that the tissue that's left behind is somehow compensated. So what do I mean by that? It doesn't simply uh, stay as it is. It appears to uh, adapt in the later stages of the disease here. So what we find here is Although there was a lot of bone loss initially, later on in the disease, the tissue that's left behind is becoming more mineralized. So we found a number of studies over the period of time that suggest that there are secondary changes in both the trabecular architecture and also the mineralization of the tissue, suggesting that there's some sort of secondary compensation response or that the mechanical environment is somehow driving secondary mineralization. So this kind of led us on to a lot of the studies in my group which have been focused on um, the, the mechanical um, 
the role of the mechanical environment in osteoporosis. So if we take uh, bone and, and its mechanobiological uh, processes, what, what's involved here? First of all, when we walk around and move around, we're applying load at, at the organ level, right? Uh, so this dictates ultimately the mechanical environment. But down at the cell level, we, the cells have some sorts of proteins, which I'll talk about some of them later on, which enable them to measure that mechanical environment. And as a result of the forces that they see, they then elicit biochemical signals that ultimately result in responses, in changes in the cells themselves, but also in cells in their environment. So this is how we break down and think about the various aspects that are important in mechanotransduction in, in, in normal bone, but also in osteoporosis. And what we're interested in as well is whether or not, that's not going ahead, no, there we go, is mechanobiology altered during disease? So not just how do these processes um, occur and what, what governs them, what sort of mechanical environment and mechanical sensors do exist and how many, um, how can we uh, govern and understand that and understand how it changes in disease? These are the sorts of questions that are interesting to us. Um, and I'll talk later on about, does a mechanobiology also play a role in tumor invasion into bone? So what's important when we look at, and you'll see the same theme arising in it throughout the talk is the um, importance of multi-scale research. So I give two examples here, uh, but bone of course is our main focus, but in, in any tissue in the human body, you have a multi-scale, uh, both compositional and functional uh, um, uh, processes at play, right? So if, if we take bones, for example, uh, at the tissue level, the tissue is hierarchically organized. There is um, uh, an intricate composition and structural organization at multiple levels that confers the mechanical properties on the tissue. And then below that, you have your cells and your molecules, which are ultimately um, the ones that are ensuring that this design is maintained throughout life. Uh, and they, they are really important for us to understand how we ultimately have strong bones. The same uh, thing applies up in, in, in our cardiovascular tissues. You know, again, we have um, an organ that has uh, various um, uh, tissue level uh, uh, structural and uh, uh, properties and composition. And then underlying that you have contractile cells and, and uh, molecular um, responses that govern uh, the behavior of the cells and the tissues that they produce and how those tissues are maintained throughout life. So this requires to understand these processes and how our, our tissues and organs function, we need multi-scale research and often uh, multi-physics also. So in my research group, uh, we work across the scales and also across different areas. So um, we here I'm gonna show you just a, a quick uh, snapshot of, of the multi-scale experimental studies, but I'm not gonna to talk too much about those today. Um, but we apply various mechanical or experimental approaches to try and understand the mechanical environment. I will talk about this to derive an understanding of both cell and tissue properties and see how these change in disease. Experimental approaches to identify the proteins that the, the cells have, but also cell in vitro cell culture, ex vivo culture, uh, to try and understand how the cells respond to mechanical load and, and gain an understanding of, of the relationship between mechanical force and ultimately um, molecular biology gene expression and changes in tissue structure and function. We also use a very variety of multi-scale imaging techniques and I'm gonna talk a bit more about this one. So um, I guess once you're moving from an organ level study down to a tissue level study and cellular level study, the imaging approaches will have to change and, and resolution is key and also uh, the types of uh, tissue structures and cellular structures that can be identified. So um, we can use uh, at the organ level, we can use micro CT scanning. And we, I'll show you some examples of that later on. Uh, at the tissue level, if we want to understand the composition of the tissue, we can use things like backscatter electron microscopy or FTIR. Um, and we can also characterize the um, tissue level uh, organization and, and structures as using um, confocal microscopy. And then at the cellular level and, and subcellular level, we move into uh, 
approaches like confocal microscopy and transmission electron microscopy. And, and this is where we're getting, we want to get further information about the cell structure itself. So we, we work across all of these types of approaches in my group. And we're also very interested in developing computational models of, of tissues and cells. So uh, we use multi-scales and multi-physics com computational modeling approaches. Uh, so we can uh, use our micro CT days based data, for example, uh, to develop models of the, the organ level bone, but also the tissue level moving at higher resolutions. And we also use confocal approaches to, to build computer models at the cell level. So these are the types of approaches that we adopt, and I'm going to talk in more detail about some of these now. So the first question that we ask using these types of approaches is, in osteoporosis, when, when bone loss has occurred, are the cells, the mechanical sensors here, these osteocyte cells, do they have the same mechanical environment as those in a healthy tissue? Why would we ask this question? You might remember that I said that bone loss occurs rapidly in the first four weeks. That means that any tissue that's left behind and the cells within that tissue should be experiencing a higher level of stress because there, there's less tissue to bear the normal loads. However, before we, we set out on the studies I'm about to show you, uh, whether or not these osteocytes had the same mechanical environment or not had never been shown. So this is one of the first questions we asked was, first of all, what is the mechanical environment at the level of the osteocyte and is it altered in osteoporosis? So when we talk about the mechanical environment of osteocytes, we must remember that I've already said that they're the mechanosensory proteins, so that we are, sorry, cells, and they have proteins that enable them to do that. So they are mechanosensitive, and, and if you take osteocytes from the body, put them in a cell culture dish and apply mechanical stimulation to them, they will change their uh, biological and biochemical responses uh, in relation to the amount of force we apply on them. So we know that they are. And I've already said again that they recruit osteoblasts and osteoclasts when that mechanical environment changes. But for a long time, precisely the nature of the mechanical environment around the cells and, and how that influence, how much signaling that they, uh, um, I suppose, elicit towards the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts was not well known. So here you can see this is um, an image of osteons and you can see black here are the osteocytes uh, in an aversion system surrounding those osteons. And you can see that they have lots of these dendrites. This is a transmission electron microscopy image of one individual osteocyte. And you can see the cell membrane here and the cell process is extending out into the matrix. And this matrix out here is a coll dense, dense collagen fibrils with uh, mineralized uh, crystals around it, hydroxyapatite. So this is a uh, you know, what we do know about osteocytes is that they must live, and this is another uh, image showing um, the osteocyte with some pseudo coloring there, showing the cell membrane in green. Um, but we know because they live in this, this particular environment they live in is known as uh, the osteocyte lacuna, and it's filled with uh, pericellular fluid and pericellular matrix. And so we know that uh, when we apply a load or a strain on the tissue itself, that this is going to have to have an effect at the cell level. Uh, and uh, most likely the cells will experience some sort of stress and strain uh, from the matrix itself, if they're connected to that. And also this fluid that surrounds the cell body must be um, moving and uh, eliciting a sheer stress on the cell membrane. But what's less well clear is what the magnitude of that is and whether or not it changes in disease. And this is quite experimentally challenging to characterize because uh, osteocytes are, are um, deeply embedded within this tissue and trying to access them, to study them without interrupting their mechanical environment is, is challenging because it's a closed system. So um, a number of uh, researchers sought to try and address this uh, challenge to try and uh, derive the mechanical environment at the level of the osteocyte using uh, mathematical models and um, Shelley Weinbaum's group and then Steve Cowan. Uh, I actually was a postdoc there myself for a while and, and we worked on some um, uh, image-based mathematical models. So we, we went and studied these osteocytes here that I, that I show you here. And we started to characterize um, uh, 
in particular, the dendrites, these cell processes, and how they were connected to the matrix that surrounds them. So uh, we did a lot of transmission electron microscopy imaging to try and understand what is the structure within these osteocytes. And then using that information, we were able to build uh, mathematical models to try and predict this here is um, one cell process in cross section. And you can see here, uh, we found these attachments, integrin based attachments between the cell process and the wall. And uh, the rest here, the, this um, is filled with a pericellular matrix and some uh, pericellular fluid. So this study, this was um, mathematically described the relationship between the external forces and the level of stimulation of the cell membrane through a mathematical approach. Others also sought to understand uh, the mechanical environment using simplified finite element approaches. So here's a, an FE model of a, an individual osteocyte, an idealized osteocyte, and, and also image-based models uh, through uh, computational fluid dynamics of the cell process itself, and looking at the levels, for example, of shear stress that experience along the osteocyte cell processes. But it, even with these approaches, you know, there were a number of unanswered questions like how does the native geometry affect the mechanical of stimulation of osteocytes in vivo? So if we take these theoretical approaches or idealized finite element approaches, uh, this does not account for this complex uh, morphology that the osteocyte has. <clears throat> and also how does loading drive stimulatory fluid flow? So what we really wanted to understand was with real osteocyte morphologies, what were the levels of shear stress matrix strain, uh, cell membrane strain that the osteocytes were really experiencing and whether they changed in disease. So how did we go about doing this? So we, um, first of all, uh, stained the bone with um, fluorescent um, uh, dyes that distinguish and label the cell membranes and, and the pericellular space. So here you can see an example of this. Uh, this is a section of bone stained and you can see the osteocytes, you can see some blood vessels here, the larger structures, and then the osteocytes here are, are um, distinguished, as are their cell processes. So you can see how dense this uh, tissue is in terms of the number of osteocyte processes that, that exist within this environment. So uh, this was work done by Stefan Verbruggen. Stefan was a PhD student in my group now. He's now a lecturer in, in the University of Sheffield. Um, but at that time, what he developed was um, he first of all conducted confocal imaging of these stained samples of bone and uh, reconstructed from those confocal images uh, the geometry. So he did uh, thresholding and segmentation in, in image process software and was able to reconstruct individual osteocyte geometries. And from that then he was able to um, extract the pericellular matrix and the extracellular matrix. So he, he could go from uh, the stained samples to the, the solid model of the osteocyte, and then from that uh, build a space uh, for the pericellular matrix and the extracellular matrix within the model. So this allowed us to develop uh, image-based models of individual osteocytes uh, that had the imaging information uh, so that we had cell resolution models. And the first thing Stefan did was he uh, used these then to look at how the mechanical environment of osteocytes uh, changed for various different osteocytes from the bone tissue. So these were all within the cortical bone tissue and also how that compared to an idealized model. And what he saw, and, and we were, I suppose, happy to see because it's been long considered that the cell processes are important in mechanosensation for osteocytes. And in fact, when we looked at where the mechanical stimuli were, the uh, greatest they appeared to be along the cell processes. Uh, so there was st strain amplification occurring at the cell membrane, but also along processes. And we also saw that uh, for the first time that the amount of stimulation of the cell membrane was above uh, a threshold, which was 10,000 microstrain, that from in vitro studies was shown to be necessary to activate these cells to change any biochemical responses. So uh, people had previously studied these cells in a cell culture dish and under matrix strain and fluid shear stress. And what they'd shown was that under strains 
below this magnitude and also under shear stresses of low magnitude that the cells didn't respond at all. And you needed to have at least this amount of stimulation for the cells to respond. So what we've been able to show is that their morphology actually amplified the uh, strain and, and uh, I'll show you in a minute some shear stress stuff as well. And much more so than the idealized geometries. So this gives us motivation to make sure that we use image-based models for studying these cells. And I've already said to you that this osteocyte lives in this um, lacuna that is filled with a mesh, a pericellular mesh and a fluid. So we do know that this fluid, if you, if you apply load externally, uh, uh, given the interconnected nature of the, the fluid space with the, the bone marrow and the vasculature, it's highly likely the fluid within this space moves and would therefore itself apply shear stress to the cell membrane. So we knew that we had to take our models beyond that point to develop models that could capture the solid fluid solid interactions that occur at the cell level. So um, what we did then was we extended our modeling approaches to include the uh, to model uh, using fluid structure interaction approaches the fluid uh, uh, space there. So this modeling approach allowed us to apply forces uh, to the, the, at the local level from, to the osteocyte. And those external forces drove uh, fluid movement within the pericellular space, but also uh, led to shear stress and uh, stimulation at the osteocyte cell membrane. So this allowed us then to quantify um, a variety of different things. We could look at the First of all, the strain in the matrix that sits around the osteocytes, what the magnitudes of those strains were, the velocity of the fluid rushing around the cell, and ultimately uh, how that leads to a mechanical stimulation of the cell membrane itself, either by fluid shear stress or, or um, direct deformation of the cell membrane. <clears throat> and, and what we could see then, we could now predict the, the types of uh, fluid velocities that arose within the pericellular space. So the, and then we could see again, just like under our finite element approach that the uh, velocity and shear stress was highest within the uh, canaliculi where the cell processes uh, exist. And not only that, what we could do then was we could show that um, these I mentioned already these thresholds, I mentioned the strain threshold of 10,000 microstrains, but in fluid shear stress, we needed to see a, a shear stress of about 0.8 pascals. If we had these cells in an experimental dish and drove fluid flow over them, they would not do anything of note in terms of biochemical changes unless we stimulated above this approximate threshold. So what we could see was by conducting this modeling was that in fact, uh, these cells, we looked at a number of different cells, all uh, experienced shear stresses above this threshold along their cell processes. And we could also look at the volume of the cell, so how much of the cell was uh, stimulated above these magnitudes. So this was important because uh, this image-based approach for predicting the mechanical environment at the level of the osteocyte had not previously been able to um, definitively uh, figure out how strain amplification occurred at the level of the osteocyte. Because these shear stresses and matrix stains that we're predicting well exceed uh, those that would be applied at the organ level. So the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was how we calibrated these models, uh, validated them, and the types of, uh, I suppose, accompanying experimental studies we conducted uh, to, to help us uh, study these types of questions. So Stefan worked with uh, Miles McGarrigal, another PhD student in my group, to develop a micromechanical loading device to study the osteocyte mechanical environment. Because although we'd done image-based modeling, we also wanted to uh, push the limits of what we could do in terms of experimental approaches so that we had a combined understanding from the modeling and the experiments. So what we did here was we um, developed a micromechanical loading device that was compatible with a confocal microscope. So you can see this image here, you can see, and um, this is a little loading device here, it was able to uh, apply loads in very small increments, about one micron, and simultaneously image as we loaded the, the bone sample um, 
and therefore we could image the cells while we were applying the load. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. So here's just showing you the, the device that they made. Um, and uh, ultimately what we were doing was uh, use an experimental approach to derive the mechanical environment in the matrix around the osteocyte and the cell membrane itself. So how do we do that? Uh, first of all, we again used uh, staining. So in this situation here, green uh, was a stain of the lacunar canalator network and uh, red was a stain of cell membranes. So what we were able to do was get some imaging of the osteocyte, um, I suppose, cell membranes in particular that we were of interest within cortical samples. So we prepared these samples so that they were uh, suitable for the loading device and we stained them. And then we loaded while uh, the, um, the stain samples were in situ, we loaded and imaged at the same thing. So the confocal microscopy was conducted throughout loading. And then we used digital image correlation approaches to track the movement of the pixels in the images as the loading uh, developed. And this allowed us to calculate the strain field uh, within the bone cells. So you can see here, uh, by tracking the, the movement of the pixels, we were able to get a map of the uh, strain distribution, both within the surrounding excel extracellular matrix. This is largely green in this image here. And then the cell itself, this is the osteocyte cell membrane. So now we had used both a computational approach and an experimental approach, both based on, on confocal imaging approaches uh, to try and quantify the mechanical environment around osteocytes. And we could see uh, actually, we're quite happy to see that the, the strain, these were different osteocytes that we were loading. So the, the average strains were, were um, similarly similar in, in the two different studies, which was encouraging to see. And um, this helped us both to validate the boundary conditions and the model predictions, but also together the computation and experimental approach provided two tools to ask questions about the mechanical environment of osteocytes in osteoporosis. So that's what we did next then. So now we took uh, bone tissue from uh, sham over animals. So these were rats that uh, uh, were either overectomized. So the ovaries were um, ligated to induce estrogen deficiency. It's a model of osteoporosis. And they were left for five weeks uh, and, and 34 weeks before we looked at the osteocytes environment again, or we were sham operated. These were our controls. What do we find? Uh, we compared using this approach the mechanical st stimulation or the mechanical environment of osteocyte within the healthy tissue and within the osteoporotic tissue. And you can see in this graph down here, we had five weeks and 34, five, 34 weeks. What we've shown. showed was that early in the disease that had a, a reduced. Um, um, sorry, an increased mechanical stimulation here. So you can see it here. So some of the osteocytes that were left behind after this rapid resorption period were highly um, stressed uh, or had very high uh, stimulation in this environment, which makes sense because there was a lot of bone loss. So any cells that were embedded in the tissue that was left behind should be bearing more load. But more interestingly, we see that by 34 weeks, so later in, in the disease, the, the mechanical stimulation of osteocytes had reverted to be uh, similar to the normal animals. So there was a, uh, evidence for early bone loss leading to high mechanical stimulation of the osteocytes, and then some sort of later compensation, possibly through tissue mineralization, to restore that mechanical environment. So by these approaches, by combining in situ confocal loading of bone sam samples, computational modeling approaches, digital image correlation. This gave us an advanced understanding of, of the osteocyte biophysical environment. And we could see a temporal nature to this change that uh, provided lots more questions for us to answer about osteocytes in, in mechanobiology. So um, the next question we wanted, I'm gonna go through this one pretty quickly, which is just on the mechanosensors themselves. So. Uh, we are interested in my group in, in what specific mechanosensors osteocytes have. So I've mentioned already the cell processes and along these cell processes during my postdoc, we identified intrigan based. These are particular proteins that attach the cell membrane to the matrix around it. Uh, 
uh, and others have had shown that there's primary cilia, which are, are flow sensors. So you can think of these as either strain gauges or flow meters, and uh, that these specialized proteins allow the cell to measure the mechanical environment that they experience. So here's some nice images of the cell, the cells with these sensors stained. So you can see here, um, this image here shows an osteocyte and these little green dots are the integrins and you can see there's lots of them. So there's lots of these proteins tethering the cell to the matrix it sits on. Uh, these are adhesion junctions here that's really green. So they're cell-cell junctions. Uh, the cells, you can see these little red proteins here. These are uh, the primary cilia flow meters. And these images on the right here just show uh, illustrations of what these sensors look like. So biology allows us to identify what these four sensors are, which cells have them, and, and try and understand how they change in disease. Um, so, but we also conduct in my lab, just for, for information, uh, we develop computational models to help us design Experiments. So this is a simple uh, CFD model to try and predict uh, the mechanical stimulation we would apply within an experiment where we're driving fluid over a population of cells under fluid shear stress. And here are the types of experimental results that we can uh, show. So this is the fluid shear stress here. This uh, model has predicted the shear stress we're applying. And then we can study uh, with and without these proteins. So this particular study looked at these integrins. So whether or not these integrin uh, proteins are important for the cell's response to the mechanical environment. And how does the cell shape and morphology change under fluid flow? And I'm not gonna spend any time talking about the biological uh, assays that we conduct on and the gene expression studies, but just to make it clear that um, we can combine the modeling approach, uh, uh, imaging to look at the cell biology and, and biochemical and gene expression studies to try and understand the, ultimately the, the changes that occur in the cells. But I just wanted to uh, explain further what we've done in terms of the um, studies on mechanical stimulation at the cell level under these experiments. So what we've done is, we uh, this is Ted Vaughan. Ted Vaughan was a postdoc in my group. He's now got his own research group at NUI Galway. Um, but we, we developed multi-scale modeling approaches to, to try and study specifically the types of mechanical stimulation our cells were experiencing within our experiments. So we had a global model of the fluid shear stress environment, a CFD model, and then a local um, fluid structure interaction model to look at the cells. And um, here we have an individual osteocyte in our experiment. We're applying fluid flow over it. And we didn't just, I suppose, leave it at that. We then used the models to try and understand these integrins, how they were being mechanically stimulated, both in our experiments, but also how they would be stimulated in vivo. So you can see here, I've shown already the integrins on an image. Actually, I'll bring them in here so people can see them again. Sorry. So there are integrins. Uh, so these green proteins here would be uh, modeled in our, in our uh, study here where we randomly allocated these attachments of the cell to its underlying substrate. We drove a fluid flow over it, and then we see under this fluid shear stress how the cells are being mechanically stimulated. Uh, we also modeled the presence of these primary cilia, so these flow meters, and we compared the mechanical stimulation of both of these sensors under the experimental conditions, but also compar co compared it to in vivo conditions to see which of these sensors were more likely stimulated in vivo and in vitro, and what was the level, relative level of, of mechanical stimulation. And this is just one study where you could see the importance of the length of this uh, cilia for the mechanical stimulation. And we were asking the question in particular here, whether if they had very short cilia, which is the case in vivo, they don't have space for these long cilia, like a chondrocyte might, would they in fact be effectively mechanical, mechanically stimulated? And using this fluid structure interaction approach, we could show that short cilia, yes, they were stimulated, but, but to a small degree. Um, so um, just to, I'm conscious of, of the time now, I'll, I'll uh, keep going on, on some other uh, approaches we've used that have combined modeling with experiments to try and understand for mechanical transduction. So um, 
I'll be very quick on these, but just to make everybody here aware that the ultimate premise of my group is that we have um, multidisciplinarity uh, inherent in what we do. So we actually do quite a lot of cell culture experiments, and this is a busy slide, but what we do is we take these um, cells on dishes and we actually drive them into different uh, uh, situations. So a healthy cell here would have estrogen, whereas one representing osteoporosis would, could be studied by estrogen withdrawal. And then we apply mechanical stimulation and study various changes in the cell biology as a result of this and see how the estrogen scenario itself actually affects how the cells are mechanically stimulated. And again, we use uh, image-based approaches. So um, this is a uh, fluorescent dye that uh, is a live cell imaging dye that allows us to identify cells that are signaling uh, by uh, intracellular calcium. So that's uh, one of the earliest responses cells have to mechanical stimulation is these intracellular bursts of calcium production. And we can see that we can actually uh, image the cells under their flow. You can see how the, they're producing calcium and the relative magnitude, how that varies between the cells under static and flow conditions, but also under these different conditions that represent healthy and osteoporotic cells. And we can then uh, process these images to look at um, how the magnitude of this uh, uh, mechanotransduction response varies in disease. And we combine these then with uh, biological assays. So um, we, we look at changes in the cell morphology, the size of their integrin attachments. Um, so whether or not they are forming these normal mechanosensors here. So we conduct a load of studies to quantify these mechanosensory proteins. And uh, we can see that simply changing the estrogen levels changes how these cells form mechanosensors and, and uh, the functionality of those. So um, now I wanted to talk very briefly about how we've used mechanobiology to inform tissue regeneration approaches. So if we take uh, how cells can regenerate tissue for, for um, tissue engineering approaches, what are the important factors? So first of all, you have cells. Uh, um, in most scenarios, people combine these with a biomaterial. Um, and then we give them some sort of nutrients. And uh, in our group in particular, we're very focused on the physical environment and that uh, these various factors together contribute to the tissue's ability to regenerate uh, and, and produce new tissues in the lab environment. So if I just uh, talk first about the cell and biomaterial stuff in my group, we are very interested in how the matrix properties around the cell dictates their cell morphology, but also uh, the, their ability to differentiate or become uh, more osteogenic and, and more primed for producing bone tissue. So here we have situations where we place our cells on matrices or, or materials of various properties, very stiffness, collagen-based matrices of different stiffnesses. And we then quantify based on imaging the changes in the cell morphology and the changes in the biological phenotypes of the cells. So whether or not they're becoming more osteogenic and more prone to osteo uh, bone production. So these enable us to develop 3D models of the osteocytes in a material. Uh, and this is a particular study that was conducted by Miles McGarrigan as part of his PhD. So that's fine. We're using mechanical stimuli to drive cell differentiation and make an osteocyte network. But even more importantly, we're interested in then recapitulating the physical environment, the biophysical environment of the cells in these matrices, which includes uh, regular mechanical loading. So what we did was we developed a compression perfusion bioreactor. This is with Miles's PhD study here. Um, and I'm going to show you the next image, which will just give you a better sense of it. So this is um, our bioreactor that allows us to run long-term experiments of uh, bone cells on matrices. And again, we use a combination of, this is DIC imaging to try and quantify under our loading. So this is compression and fluid flow within the bioreactor at the same time, because both are important in vivo for bone regeneration. And we can use DIC techniques to quantify the strain in this porous scaffold, 
as we apply the loading. So we're trying to get a sense of the, the magnitudes of the mechanical stimulation that matter for bone regeneration. We can also apply fluid velocity to them and, and we use CFD approaches to help us predict the magnitude of the fluid velocity through these porous scaffolds within our bioreactor. So um, a lot of our design of our tissue regeneration strategies relies on computational modeling. So we use uh, multi-scale and multi-physics modeling approaches to try and understand the mechanical stimulation within different design uh, scaffolds under various mechanical stimulation and different bioreactor operating conditions. So this is the work of Fei Huzhou, who was a PhD student in my group and is now a lecturer in Swansea. So what Fei did was he developed uh, multi-scale models of the scaffold uh, to pr specifically predict the local mechanical stimulation at the level of the cell. So you can see uh, within these multi-scale models, uh, he had seeded osteocytes both in bridged, sorry, osteoblasts in bridged and attached configurations and looked at how the uh, morphology of the cell, the shape of the cell and the position within the scaffold dictated the mechanical environment of the cell. And he used this approach then to look at um, the variety of different uh, cell morphologies and positions and uh, to try and understand how you could optimize the design of the cell and the seeding approach uh, to ensure the most osteogenic stimulation so that we could prime these cells to be driven towards osteogenesis. Um, he also developed mechanoregulation theory and uh, to try and uh, advance his uh, studies to try and predict how we could seed cells op optimally through our bioreactors. So these models we are developing here are linked directly to Fei who's um, work with uh, Miles on the bioreactor. So what we wanted to know was, could we use the bioreactor to optimize the seeding of the cells? So you can see in these models here, we have uh, the cell seeding density initially. So where we put the cells initially, uh, both um, on, the, on the periphery and also within the, the porous struts of the gel, how that, with the combination of mechanical loading would ultimately dictate how the cells um, moved throughout the, the uh, bioreactor operation conditions. And um, what, what Feyo did then was he, he used this combined uh, approach to look at different loading cases. So depending on how we loaded these scaffolds during cell seeding, how would this, um, how could this be optimized to achieve the most desirable cell seeding situation? So ultimately we wanted to get was an even distribution of cells throughout the, the scaffold so that, that uh, you could encourage tissue formation throughout it. So he was able to compare uh, the two different seeding approaches, whether you put them on the top or encapsulate them within the scaffold, and then the different load cases. <clears throat> and he found that poor pressures uh, had a distinct influence on cell migration and could compare the relative density of cells throughout the scaffold, depending on the loading condition. He next then uh, took it beyond that to combine it with mechanoregulation theory. So some of you may be familiar with these approaches. There's been a variety of approaches developed over the years for uh, tissue differentiation, fracture healing models. I point to two here, the Prendergast and Lacroix models, uh, because we implemented them in our model. Um, but this is where you uh, dictate the biological outcomes as a result of the a set of, of mathematical expression that relate the mechanical environment to the tissue that's formed. So here, this is complex enough flowchart, but what you start off with is <clears throat> you have your model, we seeded this model, we had a biphasic poor elastic model, and we applied mechanical loading. The, um, the loading had an influence both on the cell migration, <clears throat> but also on the tissue differentiation by mechanoregulation theory. So we had a set of rules here that said, depending on the magnitude of the stimulus, um, whether or not the cell would become fibroblastic, chondrocytes, osteoblasts, or whether or not the stimulation was so high that the cells would undergo apoptosis. And we could then run this uh, iteration over time to predict the types of tissues that would form under various bioreactor operating conditions. And, and I can just show you some examples here of the types of uh, predictions that we get using those models. So you can see here how we can predict using the combination of, of 
um, mechanoregulation theory, um, the formation of tissues under different load cases over um, a period of time of representing operation in the bioreactor. So ultimately, for our studies, we were interested in bone formation. So uh, we were looking at which of these cases was most favorable for bone formation through the, the uh, approach. <clears throat> so together, these approaches allow us um, to think about the design of scaffolds, what might be optimized for mechanically stimulating the cells. Um, it allows us to predict the magnitude of the stimulus on different locations within the scaffold, which can help us understand the importance of seeding within the scaffold. We can also predict cell migration uh, and how it's influenced by the mechanical environment, and ultimately predict how the tissue would develop under these different operator, bioreactor operating conditions. So we did this modeling approach to help us uh, study how we would uh, use our bioreactor within our experimental approaches in the lab. So I'm very conscious I'm probably running over time. The last thing I wanted to talk about, you can give me a nod there if I should finish up soon. I think we started a few minutes late, but um, I'll keep going if nobody interrupts me for another five minutes. So the last thing I wanted to say was we're combining these studies now to try and understand, drive ourselves further in terms of studying metastasis and osteoporosis. So now we are taking our bioreactors and our biomaterials-based strategies to try and understand in particular metastasis. So whether or not the mechanical environment, so this is our bioreactor, which I've just shown you. Uh, we use it now to study uh, the influence of things like compression and perfusion on the likelihood of spheroid formation. So these are tumor cells, the size the spheroids will grow um, and how the mechanical environment, the matrix stiffness, the presence of perfusion and static conditions how this influences uh, the likelihood of um, a tumor spheroid forming or the likelihood of metastasis really. So we're, we're also still continuing to pursue, this is the work of Vatsal Kumar, one of the PhD students in the group, to uh, use our imaging to help us derive computational models to not only, um, I suppose, uh, have experimental approaches, but to have modeling approaches that provide us with a phenomenological understanding how our experimental conditions ultimately dictate things like um, proliferation of the cells and, and growth of, of tumor spheroids. And we are also uh, using image-based approaches to study metastasis at the organ level. So these are the studies of Annika Verbrogan, where she is um, looking at the development, the changes in the tissue properties using micro CT-based approaches and comparing how tissue properties evolve and change in metastasis metastatic samples, so these are, are, are an animal model that have a primary breast tumor that uh, metastasizes to bone. And what we want to see is uh, can we changes in the mineralization that allow us to identify the likelihood of, of tumor occurrence. So she's doing um, quantification to compare the, the healthy and the metastatic samples to understand things like uh, the tissue density, but she's also doing nano indentation to look at changes in the properties of the tissue to try and understand the importance of the tissue for tumor occurrence. And she's using image-based approaches then to develop computational models to help us understand the mechanical environment that is ensuing in these animals. So how does the mechanical environment in an animal with a tumor uh, in, in their femoral region or the near the, the femoral head uh, compare to the healthy situation? And she's using modeling approaches to compare control and metastatic samples to understand the mechanical environment, to see whether there is a role for mechanobiology in, in the development of metastasis. And uh, because we've developed so many, uh, I suppose, 3D uh, approaches with bioreactors, what we're trying to really drive from now on is that we would do way less studies in 2D culture or animal models, but that actually we'd use our 3D models with bioreactors to, uh, first of all, make sure that uh, biophysical stimuli are accounted for when we study disease processes, uh, but ultimately to help us uh, provide a better uh, models for studying uh, bone biology and disease. So our premise in my group is that we combine biology, uh, so various different biological cells, um, computational modeling and, and engineering to try and predict uh, the ultimate mechanical stimulation and provide tools for studying biology uh, in the in vivo, uh, sorry, ex vivo environment, 
and apply these then for studying bone metastasis and disease. So I'm just going to go to my last slide now. So these are just ongoing work where we're taking our studies uh, further into 3D. So we again are using bioreactor approaches and these are studies of our cells in 3D environments. And again, rather than doing these things in 2D culture, we're using bioreactor approaches and 3D cells and gels to try and understand the pathophysiology of osteoporosis. So I'm going to, too many clicks in that one. So by combining uh, modeling, image-based uh, mod modeling and experimental studies with computational models, we can provide an advanced understanding of uh, the underlying mechanisms that lead to osteoporosis and cancer metastasis and ultimately a form of drug treatments. So uh, that's the end of my uh, talk. I just wanted to point out, I, I alluded to some of the students and postdocs as I went through the talk, but actually um, the, the work presented here was uh, the result of, of very talented PhD students and postdocs that have been in my lab throughout the years. And also uh, we've had funding, as was mentioned earlier from the European Research Council uh, through start on a consolidator grant and also the Science Foundation Ireland grants and various collaborators and um, uh, industrial partners support our research. So with that, I'd like to thank you and ask if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Professor McMara. The presentation was really enlightening. And uh, if I can talk a moment to our students, I think you have seen a very interesting uh, uh, approach. Uh, Professor McMara showed us many different ways to uh, research uh, a single topic, uh, going through different kinds of simulation, experimental analysis. I think I've seen also some uh, surface response analysis, so also different ways to analyze, to analyze the data. We can really say, I think that in this case, the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, we are uh, at the BPA summer school. Our students, I think, they have very clear the idea of how important simulation can be for research. Uh, maybe sometimes they might forget uh, how important it is to combine it also with experimental analysis and how this is just is not just the sum of the two. No? You can combining the two, you can obtain things that you would not be able to obtain using only uh, the two things separately. So I think it's very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm sure we'll have many uh, interesting questions. I think we already have one from uh, uh, one of the students. Uh, <clears throat> well, Benjamin, if you want to speak your question. Um, hi, thanks very much for the very, very interesting talk. Um, my question is about how did you decide on an appropriate constitutive model for the osteocyte in your, this is in your micromechanical models? Um, because I imagine it would be difficult to obtain stress strain data for the osteocyte itself. And um, the constitutive model would have a significant effect on your simulation results. So, so you raise a very important, for an osteocyte, it's, it's extremely hard to get the properties of the cell because you have to extract the cell from the in vivo environment to perform any sort of uh, assessment of the properties of the cell. So it's, it's easier to derive the properties of osteoblasts. Osteoblasts and osteocytes are not that different. So uh, we didn't, for the particular cells that we modeled, we did not assess the material properties. And actually we use, uh, because the models uh, were complicated in terms of the geometry, we, for those particular models, uh, assumed very simple linear elastic models, and we were doing fluid structure interaction as well. But that's actually why we combined it with the experimental approach for the, because we couldn't, um, so the validation was important there. We needed to make sure that although we're very aware that, you know, um, it is a, an assumption to, to study osteocytes as, as linear elastic mo to constitute a model and uh, that we were happy generally with the uh, experimental, the match between the experimental approach and then the uh, um, modeling approach. Um, and also another thing I should point out is that that assumption was reasonable at the low strains that we study in. in uh, so, so 
within the human body, uh, at the global level, the strains are, are, are somewhat low, although you can see, of course, the magnitudes of the strains are quite high along the cell processes. So there would be um, assumptions there that are inherent, uh, and we use the experimental approach to help us uh, validate from imaging that we are in the right ballpark. Makes sense. Thank you. Jerome also raised his hand if you want to make your question, Jerome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Simone. Uh, thanks, Lois, for this, this great talk and this great demonstration of uh, experimental and computational uh, research. My question is, I have actually two questions. Um, the first one is uh, the, your, the way you're considering uh, the biochemical environment. So when you were exploring um, osteoporosis, so uh, you were considering uh, sexual hormones uh, in, in one of the experiments. Uh, but then there are much more things. There are so inflammatory factors. Well, you know that uh, the regulation of bone between osteocytes, osteoblasts, and uh, is extremely uh, complex biochemically and everything interacts with mechanical stimuli. But you're, you're very strongly focusing on the, the mechanical side at many different scales, which is already extremely challenging. So how actually would you then choose your combined biochemical approach if you would start to, to, to make this combination? So actually, we, I, I didn't have time to talk about it, but we've already moved towards multicellular ex vivo models, so I didn't show those. I showed the 3D osteocyte models, but actually for the last about a year and a half, we've been including um, macrophages, um, uh, bone marrow precursors, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and endothelial cells in our models. So we are trying, and you because the very reason you raise a hugely important point that um, you know inflammatory, uh, signaling uh, and various different uh, intracellular signaling between the complex cells that are there are very important. So um, that's our premise. We are moving towards um, not just mechanical loading being important, but also the multicellular and, and uh, complex biochemical signaling that it could be captured when you move to more multicellular systems. And, and the inflammatory, I mean, all of these cells uh, will produce inflammatory uh, signaling themselves. So, so it's, it's not the case that it's just the, in, the estrogen deficiency, but, but the predominant change that arises in, in osteoporosis is a, a dramatic drop in the levels of circulating estrogen. So that's our, our main question is whether that drop and the mechanical environment um, ultimately alters how these cells uh, behave. And the interaction with the mechanical loading seems to be really important so that uh, the presence of estrogen is important, presence of mechanical loading important, um, and that, but actually there's a synergistic effect between both of those and that, that the two of them together are needed for, for healthy status of the cells. So, which yes, you know, inflammation is very important, but would be inherent in a multicellular model. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Then my own question and very short, but if you have, if you would have then to upscale so all these uh, research and findings to the um, to the clinical field, so actually in clinics people are interested into uh, the short term prediction of uh, osteoporosis uh, risk fra risk fracture. So actually time scales are extremely important. How challenging is that then to incorporate these time scales so in your experiments where your measurements are actually time shots. Um, static uh, static snapshots. And uh, so how challenging is it then to uh, generate time series of results that could be uh, clinically sound, you know? If, imagine yeah. you would be able to work on human material. Yeah, so um, in the human, estrogen does not deplete, you know, very quickly. It happens over a number of years, right? So the estrogen, unlike in our animal models where we, give the cells a kind of a, a dramatic and, and immediate change in their estrogen status by ligating the, the ovaries. And that's not how it, it works. The postmenopausal phase is quite drawn out. It happens over a number of years. So they don't have a dramatic drop in estrogen like we model, right? Um, but in terms of uh, um, the similarities between, you know, an estrogen deprived status and the human bone, the human phenotype of osteoporosis, what does happen in the human is bone loss does happen 
you know, relatively quickly, the majority of the initial bone loss happens, and then they hit a secondary plateau. It's it's the scale is much longer, right? So it's it's rather than our models, we have four weeks. The animals lose a lot of bone. In the human, it's of the order of a year to two years. But um, a lot of the bone loss has happened before people are ever clinically diagnosed with osteoporosis. So actually, what we're really interested in is given that that's probably always going to be the case, obviously biomarkers would help. If people were, were concerned about osteoporosis, they might attend their GP and have biomarker analysis you know, conducted to help decide which phase in the, the, the disease they were, and then you could intervene. So uh, in terms of our, our broader studies, what we're interested in is understanding the, the time sequence of changes, right? So for what period of time is bone loss occurring? And we do that through our in vivo micro CT studies. And then for what period of time do these secondary changes, which we study in the lab, but also through animal models uh, occur, which are changes in mechanical sensation, hypermineralization, um, the mechanical environment, those, we believe them to be all secondary to the initial bone loss. And what we're actually working on now through the ERC project is we're using our ex vivo models to try and understand um, the administration of sclerostin, which is an osteocyte specific therapy, which uh, would mediate osteocyte signaling for um, mineralization and also uh, osteoclastogenesis. So rather than focusing on the immediate bone loss phase, which we believe is, is challenging because people won't be diagnosed, uh, we, we're focusing on what can you do about that secondary, which also contributes to fracture risk. In terms of how long we can do things in the lab, our models now, we're running some experiments for six months. So the cells in the bioreactors, um, we can run those experiments for, for long periods of time and that's not a problem. Um, so we can uh, ex you know, study longer term interventions in our bioreactors, but whether or not that accurately captures the human time sequence, uh, we use human cells, I should have said that as well. So I didn't focus at all today on those, those 3D studies. So <laughs> I'm rambling a bit, but uh, we use human cells as well. So we can capture, the, I suppose, the pathophysiology of human cells, but again, uh, the estrogen depletion in our models is somewhat dramatic. But of course, we could just tailor it over time. So we could have it gradually drop off over time and then we could implement it in that way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerome. So we have another question from uh, Benjamin Gatton. Did I pronounce it correctly? Oh, pretty good, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, I, I'm myself, I also like bioreactors a lot. Um, and um, we, we did some work together with Sharon previously. Um, my question to you is, um, you mentioned that these cells, when you look at them in this in stiffness, in my understanding, the cells uh, always have kind of like the same stiffness, but then they're very different uh, how they produce the extracellular matrix. And then that's where the difference is coming in the environment. and. And how can you, from your experiments that you did with the electron microscopy or maybe also with atomic force microscopy or whatever, would you say that um, like all these different cell types that you looked at are really uh, very accurately distinct from each other from the, from the let's say, micro stiffnesses? Yeah, I mean, they do change their stiffness. Obviously, the, the actin cytoskeleton is, is quite dramatically different between osteoblasts and osteocytes, right? So. Uh, I mean, it depends on what level. When I was answering the previous question, I was just talking about the constitutive models, but mechanical stimuli do change as well the cell's stiffness, but it's, I suppose, in a small range that they're changing in terms of the, the relative influence of mechanical stimuli. And so your question then is, you know, whether or not the cells of, of different morphologies have, have the same stiffness or are different. They yeah, would exactly. because the organization of the actin size skeleton is very important for their, you know, stiffness. So within an osteocyte, the, the actin size skeleton is localized along the dendrites, but even under flow and under matrix stretch, the cells will reinforce uh, the, the, the cell uh, by the organization of the actin size skeleton. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So we can I mean, so did you did you do yourself? I, I did get that one uh, measured by atomic force microscopy, uh, for instance, or no? So we haven't measured 
uh, the change in the stiffness of the cells in our experimental conditions. So well, we have uh, quantified the, and again, I didn't include any of this. Uh, we've quantified the actin cytoskeleton and we've published that in terms of the osteoblasts under the eastern depletion, depleted state. So we can see that the cell morphology changes under eastern depletion for both osteoblasts and osteocytes and also how they organize their actin cytoskeleton. So in the osteocytes, when they go undergo estrogen depletion, they appear to lose these dendrites and form their much smaller rounded cells and they lose their dendrites and uh, the actin cytoskeleton organization is altered as well, which would affect the stiffness of the cell. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we have already finished the break time, actually. Uh, I'm sorry, but I think it was important to let the professor finish the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, since we are already late, uh, let me speak another question that was in the chat, just to close it with the last one. Um, would you be including investigating, including or investigating other cells that might be able to mechanosensor as well? This was a question from Syra Parag. Yeah, so osteoblasts are also mechanosensors. We, we do include in our latest models, we have osteoblasts and osteocytes. And there is kind of, we also include osteoclasts. There is limited evidence that osteoclasts are as sensitive to their mechanical environment. And we do a lot of studies with MSCs because we want to drive the differentiation of the osteocytes from uh, osteocytes. So, um, for us, you know, the cells are the mechanosensor, but we're most important interested in the mechanosensory proteins themselves. So, so that's the integrins, the primary cilia. There's also um, adhesion junctions. We've studied those as well. So they're the three main uh, proteins that we study between the, the cells that are, are acting as the mechanosensory proteins. Thank you, Professor. Um, Jerome? Do you think uh, it is better to take a few minutes break for everybody to be awake or uh, we just move to the next presentation? I would I would jump